uh, in the stump. Um, in the stem, and that may help the modulation of the pain and how it is perceived. But uh, a number of other physical therapies have been used, ultrasound, baths, hydrotherapy, thermotherapy with heat and warmth. Uh, hydrotherapy is uh, putting someone in a pool, usually a warm pool, and allowing them to mobilize and uh, hopefully that helps. Use of prosthetic devices. Um, what has been shown to be very, very effective is a combination of these with psychotherapy. Psychotherapy really is, is counseling, um, speaking to a psychotherapist and uh, them being in a helping relationship with the patient to help them understand and overcome uh, the effects and the limitations that are brought about by the phantom phenomenon. Um, what we know is anxiety, depression, and negative uh, emotions actually enhance pain, and the management of anxiety, depression, and these negative emotions actually improves the outcome of treatments of phantom pain. Cognitive behavior therapy means a psychologist or a counselor helps the patient to understand and to modify how they behave and how they respond and how they cope with the pain. And what has been shown to be very effective is really a combination of psychotherapy, but also means uh, as needed for the actual pain. Uh, quickly moving on to psychogenic pain. Uh, psychogenic pain is a chronic pain disorder that is triggered by psychological and emotional factors. Uh, it is a diagnosis that is uh, sometimes difficult to, 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 to make uh, because many patients will be complaining of pain and as a, as a rule, as a clinician, we need to believe that a patient is to them. Uh, um, this term is outdated uh, because it suffered a lot of uh, stigma uh, because many patients felt uh, people were imagining that their pain is imaginary or that the pain had did not have a very clear cause or a clear diagnosis, or that someone uh, that the pain is in someone's head, so that they are essentially having mental or psychiatric illness as a cause of their pain. So talk. Some couldn't identify that they are back. We can continue. Hello? Continue. I continue. Okay. So because of the misunderstanding of this term, it has really been discarded. Uh, so you may see the term psychogenic pain in the literature, but uh, uh, it has been redefined as functional neurological symptoms disorder or some other way that it is described to show that linkage between the brain and emotions with the experience of pain that people feel. Um, again, just like phantom pain, the, the mechanism of psychogenic pain is complex. Generally speaking, it is the sensation of pain without nociception, which means there is no direct tissue injury and someone does not have body, body harm, body tissue injury, but they are, because of their emotional and mental state, 
they experience the sensation of pain. And this kind of pain that they feel is actually very real. The reason is physical and mental health are really intricately intertwined. And they are complex parts between the physical body and the mind. And the brain actually does retain memory of pain, um, including a memory of just how bad it affected them and how bad pain affects function. So sometimes it is a mixture of what is going on in the patient's mind with actually what they are anticipating or what they're expecting. And uh, the emotional, mental, and social factors are very, very prominent in these kinds of patients. Many patients have a history of unresolved psychological and emotional issues. So by the time a, a clinician comes up with this diagnosis of, diagnosis of psychogenic pain, usually they will have assessed the mind and the emotional state of the patient. And what we have seen is that many patients who have psychogenic pain actually have underlying unresolved emotional issues. Um, often it is reported as headache, muscle pain, back pain, uh, all manner of pain. Uh, or sometimes it is it manifests as fatigue, sleep disturb disturbance, uh, changes in appetite, uh, and some patients may actually proceed to have very, very serious systemic disturbance because of their pain. How do you know that uh, this pain is likely to be psychogenic? Um, if you look and delve into the emotional and social issues of the patient, that might be something that is pronounced. You will find that they have social issues, they're anxious, they're depressed, uh, they have previous unresolved matters with their family. They may also have even spiritual pain. But when you have pain that is not explained by a specific medical condition, when there is the absence of an injury, uh, when physical exam is unremarkable, the history doesn't add up, uh, labs are normal or can't explain the physical situation of the patient. Uh, if pain is inconsistent, it is changing, it doesn't sh follow a logical anatomic pattern. Uh, someone talks about a pain that starts in the small toe, goes, on, goes to the thigh on the opposite side, goes to the back, and then goes to the head, and then is radiating to the chest. You know, those kinds of descriptions which are vague, diffuse or changing characteristics of a pain. That is not usually pain that is not alleviated by usual pain medicines, especially if it gets worse when a patient is distressed or when they are more anxious or they are sadder and have changes in mood, that is really likely to be uh, psychogenic pain. So in most cases, the diagnosis is difficult. Um, you really need to be trained to evaluate and diagnose it. Um, the pain may change. They may describe it in all manner of ways. The pain may persist beyond what the usual expectation that an injury will cause pain. Um, and patients may actually have disability. They may fail to walk, they may fail to sleep, and they may, may really have a, a very bad quality of life. Uh, how do you assess pain? How do you score it? Just like all pains, uh, it is very difficult to measure. Even physical pain is difficult to measure. 
we will rely on numerical rating skills and uh, visual analog skills. But for psychogenic pain, especially our history is very important. Self-reports uh, are important. Uh, we often will ask patients to keep a record of their pain and uh, chronicle it in journals and diaries. And there are various questionnaires that have been validated uh, to explore what the pain is all about. Things like the brief pain inventory are very, very useful in the assessment of, of psychogenic pain. By and large, it is useful to observe the patient, perform a physical exam, uh, look at non-verbal cues, how their facial expression is, how they are holding their bodies, are they able to walk, are they not able to walk, and if required, do the necessary lab and uh, radiological investigations. The goal of this investigation is really to ensure that you can check and determine that there are no other physical or organic reasons behind the patient's pain. And if you can demonstrate that, then that lends itself um, credibility to the diagnosis of psychogenic pain. Is it serious? Can there com be complications? Yes, psychogenic pain is serious. Uh, it has been described as very real uh, by the patients who uh, suffer it. It can uh, impact health and well-being. Um, it can bring about mental health challenges like anxiety and depression, reducing the quality of life, and it can be quite incapacitating. There are some patients who are not able to walk and able to live because of poorly controlled psychogenic pain. Fortunately, the prognosis of psychogenic pain is really positive, and as long as patients are assessed by a qualified person and treatment is instituted, usually it will resolve. What are the modes of treatment? Self-treatment is, is often unsuccessful. So rarely will patients go to the nearest pharmacy, prescribe for themselves medicines and get better. Usually the underlying psychological issue should be recognized and addressed. And then it is after that part has been uh, recognized and addressed that therapy becomes uh, effective. Uh, usually, you will need an individualized treatment plan, depending on what the conditions of the patient are. And uh, it is useful to combine uh, therapies. So what usually happens is we shall combine psychological therapies which form the backbone of the treatment of psychogenic pain. Uh, most commonly, they will use psycho, um, cognitive behavior therapy. This is really counseling that helps patients to understand uh, their illness and the effect it has on their well-being and empowers them to put in place changes in their behavior and coping strategies to manage the pain. But there are lots of other um, there are lots of other kinds of therapies, for example, the acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, this one, in effect, uh, is a counseling of the patient to say, look, you are going to have pain and pain is part of life and you must be committed to living a near normal life or as normal as possible life, despite a certain amount of pain. So this is what acceptance and commitment therapy is about. But other than that, there are all other kinds of therapies, mind-body therapies like meditation, tai chi, yoga, hypnotherapy, um, but also physical therapies, exercises, strengthening muscles, strengthening uh, persistence, endurance, and strength, um, educating the patient, 
uh, other ther therapies like TENS and acupuncture we have already talked about in uh, phantom pain, but there is also a role for actual treatment. Uh, when patients have uh, an underlying emotional or social problem, they may have anxiety and depression, and there may be room for specific treatment of those conditions uh, using medicines. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I would like to thank you. I hope I have uh, tackled these two types of pains and brought some insight into what they are and uh, how to up. Window. Are you still there, Doc?